everybody and welcome to today's episode of Downstream Outdoors. Today on Downstream Outdoors we're doing our first edition of trapping. Um, I'm joined with a good friend of mine, Bill Weaver. Uh, Bill Weaver has been trapping for now 15 years you say? Yep. And uh, he's going to take us through a whole series of trapping episodes. This is just going to be the first one where he's going to talk a lot about the basic equipment and such you need for trapping. So at this point I'm going to turn it over to Bill and let him take over. Okay. Uh, just to go over some of the things that you can use and some of the different types of traps that are used, um, especially here in Pennsylvania. Anywhere you go, you need to know your laws about trapping. What size traps you can use, what type of trap you can use. Stuff like that. You don't ever want to go anywhere without knowing the laws. So these are your common foothold traps right here. These are coil spring traps. And this is a long spring trap. This is a size one and a half. This is a one and three quarter coil spring. This is a one and a half coil spring with a double jaw. And this is a common one and a half coil spring with a straight jaw. This has an offset jaw. It has a small gap between the jaws and the different pans and dogging systems for the traps. The basic parts of your trap are your spring levers, the frame, the jaws, the dog, and the pan. You'll also have a chain. That's what you'll stake the trap into the ground with or off to a tree or something like that. The jaw spread in Pennsylvania, the largest jaw spread that you can use is six and a half inches. It depends on game warden to game warden, whether it's six inches, six and a half inches outside spread or inside spread. I've run into the game wardens that go either way. These are trap setters. You'll see me use these whenever I'm setting the one type of trap. Most of the time the traps have a big enough spring lever that you can push on it with your hands to open it. The one type of trap that I have, you have to put these on because it's a very short lever. This is what they call a DP or dog proof trap. This is used for raccoon trapping. Now occasionally you will get a skunk or a possum or something like that in them, but it's usually pretty far and in between. You put the bait in this hole, the trap is set like this. You put your bait in there, the raccoon comes along, reaches in for the bait, and his foot's caught. You'll see me set a few of these also. You can also actually use the good old rat trap for weasel trapping. They're pretty fun. This one here is actually very worn out, but it's the only one I could find for this. The rest of them are in my box. Um, I don't have any of my boxes here right now, but I usually put this in a box with a little hole in it. Put my bait in there, the weasel will come in and be caught. Weasels are actually very small, so this works really well for them. This is a cable restraint. This is the only thing that we can use in Pennsylvania for snaring. You have to take a class by the game commission in order to get a license to use these. This season doesn't come in until the day after Christmas. These are set just like a snare, this lock, and there's a stop on here just in case a deer would get its foot or something into it. They're set depending on what animal you're catching, how high you want to set it for fox or for coyote. That's all you can catch in a cable restraint. They just passed a law now that if you get an incidental catch in one of these, you don't have to release it except for a bobcat. You can keep your incidental catches in these now, but you're only supposed to target fox and coyote. Now, and we'll come back and we'll do a full episode on you yep. actually showing us how to use the cable restraint system and everything yes. uh, for trapping purposes. That'll there, be in the future broadcast. Yep, there are a lot of laws that go around these. The reason we have to use a cable restraint instead of a an actual snare is because of dogs. There is a lot of urban sprawl 
around and a lot of people walk their dogs <coughs> and everything, these won't choke the animal down and kill them like a normal snare will. Sometimes a normal snare actually will not kill an animal either. They'll be standing there waiting for different staking systems for the traps. You have your common rebar stakes. There's also super stakes or chain stakes that you can use. I do like these. They're very light to carry. They don't take a whole lot of room up. The same with these. These are what they call disposable stakes or cable stakes. For me, they're not so disposable unless of course I get through a tree root or a rock and I cannot get it out of the ground. They'll just stay in the ground the cable will rust up and disappear within a, you know, a few months to a year. But sometimes I've left these in the ground and gone back the next year and actually hooked my trap right back to them and used them again. These are anywhere from two to three dollars a piece. So it's kind of not economical to leave them in the ground. You kind of pull them up. Basic tools that you'll need are a good shovel, a trapper shovel, which some guys will take a larger shovel and grind it down, but they do sell these with a nice V handle on them for you. They're very small, actually pretty lightweight, and you can dig your dirt holes with them, you can dig your trap bed with them nice and small. I also carry just a small, like, garden trial. This one's actually out of a metal detecting section of the store. It's a little bit more heavy duty, so uh, you'll need a good hammer. I usually carry a two and a half pound mini sledge. That'll get your stakes into the ground. A good sifter for your dirt. And sometimes, and most of the time, I carry a small hatchet with me on the line. This is for all you axe junkies out there. Um, this, if I'm doing a log crossing over a creek or something like that, where I see raccoon scat or something like that, I'll actually chip a trap bed into the log as long as it's not a live tree and I'll actually put my trap right to that. So that comes in handy and it also comes in handy if I need a stake for a urine post set, which in other episodes I'll show you how to set a urine post set. Um, you have your baits and your lures. This is one of the more common things used. This is fox urine. It's red fox urine. Red fox, gray fox, and coyote are all very territorial animals. So if you bring somebody else's urine in there and you spread it on a set, they're going to say, hey, who's here? They're going to go investigate. They're going to remark their territory. Coyotes and red fox do not get along at all. Gray fox and coyotes will kind of live in the same area because a gray fox can actually climb a tree, whereas a red fox cannot. So a lot of times as coyotes move into the area, the red fox are either going to leave or they're going to be killed. These are lures that you can get and actually a two ounce bottle of lure like this will last you a very long time. You do not need a whole lot of this. This is a call lure. This is a very strong smelling lure. It has castor and skunk essence in it. You kind of smear it above your set a little bit and then the wind catches it and the coyote's walking across the field and he goes, what's that smell? And he goes over to investigate. You also put bait at the hole too. That way the neck keeps him there and sniffing around and oh, what's that? There's also food lures. There's um, gland lures and everything like that. This is a bait. It's ground up meat. It's been either preserved or tainted just a little bit. And that gives it a smell, you know, a fresh meat smell or just a little bit of a tainted meat smell. That way then that'll keep them attracted to your, to your set and want to find out what's there to eat. This is also a lure here. This is a liquid mouse. This is ground up mice um, put into a liquid form. Mice are a big staple of any predator's uh, diet. You have fox that eat mice and voles, coyotes and everything. Even raccoons will sometimes dig up, dig them up in the winter. I also use a little bit of sheep's wool at some of my sets just to hold the lure into. 
if you have a local farmer around that has sheep you can go and get this usually you can pick it off their fence or whatever or even sometimes if you're lucky they'll sell you a bag full you know for five bucks or so that's and I also have a trapping basket down here you want a good backpack or basket or a trapper's bag or something like that to carry your tools in whenever you go out into the field I also have a trapper's basket or a trapper's bag that I don't have here on the table but you just want something to put your trap in or whatever and you also want a good pair of gloves I just use the Jersey cotton gloves that way then once you've boiled and waxed your traps and everything else you're not touching them and getting a whole bunch of scent on them and everything like in my area there's a lot of people activity that the animals smell humans all the time so they're passing tracks that are going through the woods where people have hunted and everything but they're still following the same trail what you want to try to do is you want to try to keep the human scent off your trap that way then they're more apt to go over there and say hey what's this rather than smell all the human scent and go oh, I've smelled that before and keep walking difference like I said the different staking systems for the traps this is a double staking system what you do is you take two rebar stakes put them through these holes and you want to crisscross them into the ground and pound it down as tight as you can that way then that crossing system holds that trap in so that the animal can't work it out of the ground and run off with your trap. These traps have not been boiled or waxed or anything, so you know that's I'm hand handling them barehanded. I have set traps with bare hands and caught things. It just depends on the area that you're in and everything else. Basic setting of your trap, push down on the levers, Pop your jaws open, hold it tight, and set your pan. Another video, I'll show you how to set up your, your traps to make your pan nice and level. You want it nice and level so that it doesn't stick up above the jaws and push the dirt up at your set. That's set and ready to fire. You just fire it, the animal steps on it. A lot of people think that these hurt the animal's foot, which you'll you'll see later on that it's not as bad as everybody thinks. No pain, nothing. Or you get your glove caught in. When I've walked up to Fox sitting in the trap, they're curled in a little ball, they're actually asleep with the foot on their the trap on their paw, and then whenever I get up there they stand up. What's that? Long spring traps, you'll see in all the paintings and stuff like that of the old time trappers. The guys who really pioneered going out west and looking around. These are the type traps that they used to use. I actually like to use these as water traps and these for my land trapping. I forgot to bring a conibear over to show you, but I can show you those whenever we do a little bit of water trapping for some muskrats, which comes in at the end of the month. Um, but these I like to use in the water. They're a little bit harder to bed into a trap bed. But these traps are the ones that broke the ground for the fur trade back in the 17 and 1800s as like Daniel Boone and all those guys going out through the West. That's basically about it. <coughs> well, that, that, that's about it on the basic equipment that Bill's going to be using during this series of trapping uh, uh, videos that we're going to put out.
Uh, we're going to get into a lot more detail as far as the actual sets on them and what he's doing and putting different scents and stuff down with each set and trying to attract different animals for those, for those traps. Um, I know we're going to do a little bit more prep work here. We're going to do some uh, boiling and waxing of some traps here at a point. And we'll show all that. Um, we're going to try to teach you as much as you can as, as we can about trapping. But ultimately it comes down to, you know, if, you, if this is something that interests you and you want to learn more on your own, you're going to have to go out and find yourself some books and read some books and find guys like Bill and, uh, you know, walk their line with them and watch what they're doing. The guys like Bill and guys like myself, when we have a passion for something, we love to share that passion with other people. And if people would just come and talk to the, the people that are into things like this, a lot of times they're more than happy to show you exactly what you're doing so that you're doing it safe, you're doing it ethically, and you're doing it the right way. And uh, just like fishing though, I'm sure you do things differently than say the, the guy who taught you how to trap. Yep. He, he's, he's doing things. So everybody's gonna learn things a little bit differently and they're gonna experience things and they're gonna see things that they do and they need to change and their style's gonna change with time. So uh, to anybody that is an experienced trapper, you may see Bill, Bill doing things and go, wait, I don't do things like that. That's fine. Bill has his way, you have your way, and everybody has their way of doing things their own way. Yep. But that pretty well does it for this episode. And we're gonna get back into these trapping episodes. And until next time, keep your line wet and out of the trees.